Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Such a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Um, maybe you could just kick off with a brief introduction to this incredible film, Blue Jean. Um, people who don't know anything about it, what can they expect when they watch it? Blue Jean is a portrait drama. Um, it centers around one woman, uh, a lesbian PE teacher in the 1980s. And it's set uh, in the lead up to this new law coming in that was section 28. And for those of you who don't know, that was a law that was passed in 1988 and was enacted until 2003 in the UK or, or 2000 in Scotland actually. Um, and it said that it was illegal to promote homosexuality in schools and local governments. And it was sort of brought about because at that time, public opinion was that if children were taught that gay people existed, that uh, people sort of felt like more children would grow up to be gay, um, which obviously wasn't true. And it ended up silencing a whole generation of uh, students and teachers. And that's kind of what the, what the film uh, explores. And it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it's really not that long ago um, if you think about it in the grand scheme of things, yet not that many people are really that that familiar with this piece of legislation, or indeed just what impact it did have on kind of a whole generation of people. Um, so what was the initial trigger for you to perhaps, you know, set a story in this period of time and particularly, you know, follow this character? What was the inspiration? Yeah, it's funny you say that because... Um... I didn't know anything about Section 28 and I was sort of, I was working with the producer Ellen Seifer and we, we sort of knew the kinds of themes we were looking to explore in our film. Um, but at the time we were looking at something that was present day and as I was researching something else I came across an article about Section 28 and I was struck by the fact that I didn't know anything about it and how long it had been and also the fact that when it had been um, repealed, I didn't remember there being much about it in the newspapers. And actually, when you look back at the press from the time, there really wasn't much coverage of it. And it was only in 2018 when we started working on the film um, that I saw a little bit more coverage in the press because there was a 30 year anniversary of the law coming in. And so there was some coverage, but perhaps that was also just because I was looking for it. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, part of the reason for wanting to tell the story was in response to that, in response to a sudden realization, a, a personal realization that this law had had a huge effect on my life without me ha having known that it existed. Um, and I started to kind of unpack that while simultaneously thinking about what it must have been like for teachers at that time um so I always had this sort of the two ideas kind of running concurrently in my mind um the effects that it would have had on a student and also the effects that it would have had on a teacher which led us to meet uh, a handful of PE teachers who had worked at that time and, and lived this experience and they were very much a part of the development process from beginning to end all the way through they were with us on set advising on various things um, and that gave the whole process this sort of extra layer because even when we had to go on hiatus for a long time in COVID, we always had these women in the back of our minds and there was never a point where we felt we would sort of stop bothering because it was actually quite difficult, as you well know, to get a film off the ground, but something to do with the fact that we were always in contact with those women, or at least we had those women in our minds who had shared things like their diaries with us, their photographs. And it was, uh, that was a big part of the kind of impetus to keep going and persevere with making the film. Mm. And you can sort of feel that that level of research has fed through. Um, and then it's not just in kind of, you know, what was happening politically or kind of this social climate, but also for the era, you know, it's just so brilliantly um, brought to life, you know, whether it's about pop culture, you know, still of blacks on, on the TV and the background and, you know, the clothes they're wearing and everything. So was that also really important to you to kind of really nail um, everything about that particular era to really put us in that place? Yeah, I mean, I, in terms of, I guess there's two things there. There's the sort of aesthetic of the film and then and then there's the um, sort of 
background information, uh, like blind date. And I guess from the very beginning, I was thinking about the effects of Section 28 on a, on a student or on young people and how growing up in a world devoid of role models and, and sort of being um, bombarded by heteronormative messaging, how that goes on to affect people. Because there was this, this idea of internalized homophobia, which we always sort of set out to, to unpick in the film. And I, as far as I know, that, that term was only coined kind of more recently. People who lived that experience in the 80s didn't, there wasn't a word to describe what all of this messaging does and how that then worms its way into your own mind and makes you feel about yourself. Um, and so I was always keen to kind of pepper that into this, into the story um also because that was my memory of growing up was watching blind day every weekend and not noticing that these were the messages that i was absorbing and i also obviously was thinking about i was always trying to think about what was happening then but also what's happening now and i was thinking about things like love island that people still watch every week and how the messaging isn't all that sim dissimilar so there was that side of things that I was trying to show, obviously in a world pre-internet, um, these messages, whatever was on television, whatever was in the newspaper, whatever was on the radio or on a billboard, that was the information that you were absorbing that day. There wasn't a way of saying, oh, I'm not sure that I really agree with that. I'm just gonna go online and look at 200 other articles by different people who have a different opinion. So <clears throat> yeah, so that was what I was thinking in terms of the kind of background and then, um i in in terms of the aesthetic yeah i worked very closely with the uh, production designer and the costume designer and the cinematographer to create a world that we felt was authentic for the 80s and for newcastle at that time but that also had a sense of timelessness hopefully um we were always trying to tell a story that could be in conversation with um what's happening now and and I felt that by attempting to create some authenticity but also um but also make choices that felt a little bit more timeless it, with the music as well um that music is of the time but not necessarily you don't necessarily know exactly what year it is when you hear those tracks hopefully so um that was kind of where we were going with that. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm almost out of time, but you know, just also to mention, I think what also stands out for me is it made me realize, you know, you have seen more and more kind of LGBTQ plus films in recent years, but perhaps they've actually been more male focused. And I don't know how many films I've really seen kind of focusing on the female experience and from like the lesbian perspective. And that, so that felt quite fresh to me. And, and, and maybe a few words also about this incredible central performance from Rosie McEwen, um, who just really sort of transforms into the other person, you know, obviously it's like, you know, the, the, the way she looks, but also her accent, you know, and she's just so, so, so great in this role. Yeah, I mean, Rosie's, Rosie's performance speaks for itself. And I, I, uh, yeah, I, I I can't wait for more people to see it. I think she did such an amazing job, and it was it was just an instant click. And I don't think I need to elaborate too much on that. But one thing that I was really keen to explore with the film was um, a, a lesbian relationship that felt sort of lived in and authentic to me, uh, which was something that just as a viewer I hadn't felt that I had much exposure to. And so I, there were always those scenes in the film from the beginning of. Uh, Jean and Viv just sat on the sofa eating pot noodle, that kind of thing. And uh, we worked a lot on, um, before we shot, we had rehearsal time with those two actors and I was blown away by the chemistry between them. And that was something we were really keen to portray, just, just this sort of sense of um, ease in their relationship. And, and, and in terms of representation, that was something I was thinking about. Um, in terms of it being, a film about lesbians and there not being that many films about lesbians. Um, I think, it, obviously I feel very privileged to have been able to tell that story and I hope that the floodgates will open and we'll start to see a lot more queer films by queer women. Um, but one thing I will say about that is that uh, because there aren't so many of them, it actually becomes quite difficult because there's this sort of expectation that your narrative will 
tell the story of all lesbians because uh, there aren't so many of them out there. And um, I definitely felt a pressure uh, when we were developing the film, you know, if one person read it and they didn't, they hadn't had that exact, if they were a queer woman, let's say, and they hadn't had that exact same experience as Jean, then it was kind of dismissed. And I, I think that's, that's, that shows how sort of dangerous it is to, to um, you know, not allow people to tell their stories because uh, we need to have all sorts of films um, about queer women made by queer women so that we can kind of break down that barrier and not expect every film about lesbians to, to do everything. Um, and the same could be said for um, anyone that's ever, ever been othered, I guess, but that was my experience with this film. Mm. And also kind of the approach you've taken um, to sort of putting her really in her shoes. And, and the thing that I noticed when I was watching it is that this kind of this feeling of tension throughout the whole thing, even, you know, in a scene which you sort of on the face of it, you know, there's nothing that's an, an overt threat, but there's a feeling of tension constantly. There's a self-consciousness uh, about the character, always feeling like maybe she has sort of, you know, a big target on her head. And I thought that was really clever the way that was done because, um, you know, it's not quite going into a thriller, but you're sort of using different techniques to kind of help us feel like, you know, she's constantly feeling on edge and, and that mm. really, you know, and that kind of builds up the more people are starting to talk about this section 28. And you feel like, well, what impact must that have on a person to constantly feel that tension? Yeah, and that was a conscious choice. I mean, no teacher was actually ever prosecuted under this law. Um, what we found was that the sort of um, intense paranoia that that this gave rise to was the most damaging thing and as a result multiple women that we spoke to spoke of unraveling mental health problems and there was a lot of that in the script i remember there was a line when she's in the staff room about her being still as a hunted deer and that feeling was something that rosie just understood and and, and was able to communicate from her first uh, audition tape and uh, it was that energy and that stillness that convinced me that she was right for the part and, and also the ability to communicate all of this complex anxiety bubbling under the surface, but um, but sort of masking that at the same time, being the, the ability to mask it. Um, yeah, I mean, Rose is utterly brilliant. And um, yeah, I'm really proud of her performance. And in terms of, you know, what you would hope the impact of your film to be, um, I guess it's kind of drawing attention to the fact that, as we said at the beginning, this is actually very recent history. The effects of things like this still feed through into today. And then there's also plenty of issues where we haven't really progressed that much. I'm thinking about all the furore recently over you know, Sam Smith's latest video, mm. or, you know, the trans debate and how that often plays out online. So, you know, maybe the, the, the debates have shifted, but maybe progress in and of itself is not something that we've achieved. So, you know, what does a film like this kind of bring to the surface in terms of those sorts of issues? Yeah, I would hope that um, showing exactly what happened in kind of microscopic detail, if 30, said four years ago, I, I would hope that, uh, people will be able to draw parallel, parallels. I mean, the language used by the media at the moment it, in the issues that you've just said uh, is, is exactly the same language that we found going back through the archives um, of you know, newspaper cuttings from the 80s. So I think there's something about the fact that our rights are extremely precarious and that we should never be complacent is, is something that I would hope audiences would take away. Um, and also, I guess there's a discussion there about activism and, and the different forms that that takes and how sometimes it's the smaller things um, that can add up to make a big difference. Um, uh, you know, I, I am a step parent to a six year old and we always like to teach her that, you know, it doesn't matter how small you are, you can still make a difference. And I think this film sort of touches on that and how it doesn't necessarily have to one doesn't necessarily have to always be sort of publicly flying a flag, but there is a responsibility and an, and an ability to make small changes that add up to something bigger. Um, so I guess that would be something audiences could take away from that. And, you know, just very quickly, the, the response that you've had to this film must just be 
um, such a wonderful feeling because you never know, you know, with you know an independent film, how far it's going to travel, how many people are going to see it. But, you know, right from when it was at Venice through to, you know, going through into this award season um, and just kind of the audience response to it must mean a lot to you. And maybe just say if, if you've already got another project um, lined up yet. Yeah, uh, well, obviously I'm bowled over by the response to the film. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, we... We, we were also told multiple times that this film would struggle to find an audience um, and that, you know, for obvious reasons, I think people are a little bit skeptical about s smaller films about queer women. Um, so the fact that it was able to premiere at Venice and, and play multiple other festivals after that and the fact that it's picked up a few audience awards is totally surprising to us after that uh, process. But um we're really, really pleased and we hope that it means that more people who need to see the film will be able to see the film. Um, and what was the last bit? Oh, what, am I working on other things? Yes, I'm working on some other things, uh, but all in sort of early stages, writing stages, so not much that I can talk about right now. Right, well, thank you so much for sharing all that with me and I can't wait for everyone else to have the opportunity to see this really wonderful, wonderful film. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's been great talking to you.